Greetings, folks, and welcome to the world of the Bhagavad Gita. The most useful thing I can probably say right now is, buckle up, this is going to be a ride. The Gita is, I think, the most challenging thing I'll be asking you to read this term. And not just because it emerges from a culture sphere with which most of my students historically have been unfamiliar. It's a complex work unto itself, both religiously and philosophically. And it also draws on cultural assumptions that, as I said, most students in the West are unfamiliar with. This being the case, most of my effort in the first week of this two-week unit will actually be directed toward contextualizing the Gita itself. I will talk a bit about content, probably in the last talk of the week, but I think in the absence of the context, much of the content won't make all that much sense. Now that said, I would like you to read Discourses 1 through 6 for this week so as not to fall behind and to have some sense of what it is I'm actually talking about. And also, of course, to bring your own thoughts and questions to our online discussions. That said, I'm going to break the introduction up into two parts. Part 1 will address the historical and cultural background of the text, as well as getting into a discussion of, for example, some of the gods of Hinduism and some of the ways in which one might approach the gods of Hinduism. It will also introduce a few key terms that you're going to need in appreciating what the text is actually doing. Part 2 of the introduction will get into the Gita's textual setting as it is actually part of a much larger work whose broad strokes I think we need to appreciate as this is the context in which Krishna and Arjuna are having the conversation that is the body of the text that we're looking at. Now, speaking of Krishna and Arjuna, you may notice that there is a picture on this slide, a chariot being drawn by four horses with a blue-skinned charioteer and a warrior whose skin is not blue. This is Krishna and Arjuna. Krishna is the blue one. And we will talk about that in a bit. Just thought right now you might like to know what you're looking at. For now, though, let's jump into a bit of history. Now, you may remember that in our discussions of Genesis, particularly, for example, the creation myth and the flood myth, I traced those back as far as I was able to go. I'd like to do something similar to that with our discussion of the Gita, as the prehistory of the text, or the prehistory of the culture that produced the text, is actually very interesting and might actually help us draw connections across what appear to be broad cultural gulfs. And to do that, we need to talk briefly about language. This probably won't surprise you, as I did spend a fair bit of time talking about linguistic questions at least a little bit when we were discussing Genesis and the Quran. For example, names for God in Arabic, Hebrew, Babylonian, and other Semitic languages. The Gita, though, is not written in a Semitic language. It is written in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a member of the broad Indo-European language family, and I'd like to say a bit about that right now. The notion that there might be a broad language family, including languages ranging from Europe to Western Asia, traces back to the early modern period when Western scholars, having recently come into contact with the classical writings of ancient India, which are written in Sanskrit, started noticing linguistic similarities between Sanskrit and the classical languages of European culture, namely Latin and Greek, and subsequently hypothesized that the best explanation for these commonalities was a common ancestor. Long story short, they were right, and the language families currently recognized as belonging to the broad Indo-European group include Italic, Celtic, Germanic, Baltic, Slavic, Hellenic, Armenian, Indic, Iranian, Anatolian, the language of the Hittites, which is extinct, and Tocharian, a language group spoken in western China, and which is also extinct. There were other languages that could also be classified as Indo-European, but these survive only in fragmentary inscriptions and there's no real use in getting into them here. Now, to touch upon some of these briefly for reasons that will actually become apparent, the Italic, Celtic, and Germanic language families are all reasonably closely related. The sole surviving representatives of the Italic language family are what we call the Romance languages, 
the language is descended from Latin, so for example, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, etc. There were other non-Latinate Italic languages, but the expansion of the Roman Empire pretty much did those in. The Celtic languages were once broadly spoken across much of Europe and parts of Western Asia, but currently survive only in, on the one hand, the languages descending from Old Irish, so Irish, Scots Gaelic, and Manx, and on the other hand, in the languages descending from Bretonic, or Old Welsh, in other words, Welsh, Cornish, and Breton. The Gauls in what is now France and Switzerland and parts of Spain were a Celtic people, as were also the Galatians, as in St. Paul's letter to the Galatians. As I said, this was once a widely dispersed culture group. As for the Germanic languages, I'm speaking one right now. These include the languages of the Goths, now extinct, the Northern group, which was the languages of the Norse peoples, the Vikings, currently represented by the various Scandinavian languages, and the West Germanic group, which includes the continental Germanic languages of which English is one. These also include German, Dutch, Frisian, Low German, Yiddish, and a couple of others, including Afrikaans. But as this isn't the course in language, I'm going to move on. As for the Baltic and Slavic languages, these are quite closely related. The Baltic languages with the largest speech communities currently are Lithuanian and Latvian. While the Slavic languages, of course, include Russian, Belarusian, Ukrainian, Polish, Czech, Slovenian, and a handful of others. The Hellenic branch is represented by Greek and Macedonian. The Armenian branch by Armenian. As for the Indic and Iranian groups, these are also quite closely related. The Iranian languages are descended from Old Persian and include, but of course are not limited to, Farsi and Urdu, the languages of Iran and Pakistan. The Indic languages are descended from Sanskrit, as I mentioned. The most widely spoken of these currently is Hindi. Pali, the language of the oldest surviving Buddhist scriptures, is also an Indic language. It descends from Sanskrit. I'll have more to say about that when we get to the Diamond Sutra. In fact, you may be wondering why I took the time to get into language at all. And the reason is basically that language is not content neutral. As the speakers of Proto-Indo-European dispersed across Europe and Asia from probably central Turkey or eastern Turkey or maybe a little north of there, doesn't really matter, as they dispersed from about 6,000 years ago or so. They took their language with them and the language of course changed as languages do, but they also took their mythologies and their social structures with them and those mythologies and social structures were expressed largely in language. Moreover, the social structures also were expressed or addressed or explained or explored in mythology. So where we find Indo-European languages being spoken, we also find related mythologies and we also find in many cases related social structures. Just to take a quick example where social structures are concerned, in medieval Christian Europe, society was seen as being divided into three estates, the first, second, and third. Those who pray, those who fight, and those who work the land. In other words, the church, the aristocracy, and the peasantry. This is simply a Christian rebranding of a social system or social organization that pervaded throughout pagan Celtic Europe, in which the role of those who pray would have been taken up by the Druids. This also corresponds with what has been, I think, convincingly argued as a tripartite social structure in Proto-Indo-European society itself with a priestly class or caste, a warrior class or caste, and what we might call a fecundity class or caste, those concerned with not just farming but also the artisan trades. These have been described as first, second, and third functions and these functions all seem to appear not just in various iterations of Indo-European society, but also in many iterations of Indo-European mythology. Hold on to that. I will have more to say about it in a bit. For the time being, though, as we're talking about social structures primarily, I'll simply say that those three social classes that come out of pagan Celtic Europe and are rebranded, as I said, in Christian Europe as the three estates, correspond exactly with the upper three of the four castes of Hindu thought in India. The Brahmin class, the priestly caste, 
the Kshatriya class, the warrior administrative caste, and the Vaishya caste, or the, basically, as I said, farming and artisan class. But as I said, more on that later. I just thought it would be useful to get a sense of the broad relatedness of many mythologies and cultures and social structures before we delve into one in depth. Things are so very often more closely related than we actually realize on the surface. And I find these relationships to be, well, quite frankly, a subject of lifelong fascination. That said, and again, more on this later, as Arjuna, one of the two principal characters in the Bhagavad Gita, is a warrior, he is a member of the Kshatriya caste, and broadly speaking, a representative of that second Indo-European function. I'd like to say a bit about that. Specifically, I'd like to talk about the figure of the Indo-European epic hero. The epic hero is a type of character, or rather a character type, that shows up in narratives from one end of the Indo-European world to the other. Literally, from India to Iceland. He is a second function figure, that is, a warrior type, and typically has some connection to the divine. Now, this may vary from culture to culture, of course. And when some Indo-European cultures become Christianized, this narrative motif or narrative pattern does change, but you can still see signs of it. Mixed divine human parentage is common. In fact, the earliest usage of the word hero, heros in Greek, goes back, I believe, to Hesiod, and his definition of the heroic age was the age or an age in which people of mixed human and divine parentage basically had their heyday. Achilles, for example, is the child of a human father and a divine mother. The Irish epic hero Cuchulain, sometimes referred to as the Irish Achilles, has a human mother and his, his paternity or paternal side is actually kind of weird. He has both a human and a divine father or human and a spiritual father. This also is a motif that shows up in the narrative context of the Bhagavad Gita. And in a sense, Arjuna also has both human and divine parentage on his father's side and a human mother. Yes, that sounds a little confusing. I will sort that out with you in the second introductory talk. Now, the hero also seems to be sort of a boundary figure. The realm of heroic action is usually a frontier of some sort. It can be a martial frontier, for example the no-man's land between the beach and the walls of the city of Troy in the Trojan War, or the battlefield on which Arjuna and Krishna have their conversation. Or it can be plunging into the underworld, for instance, or opening up some other realm to human exploration or understanding. And in keeping with being both a boundary figure and having a connection to the divine, the hero often seems to be sort of a conduit through which or through whom something important but otherwise lacking enters the world of human activity. Be this his particular strength, his particular potency, and the epic hero always has more of that than anybody else, or sometimes perhaps something a little more abstract, such as knowledge or understanding. In any case, Arjuna, broadly speaking, is a member of this type, and when we talk about him, I'd kind of like to talk about him in that sense. I think that will help maybe look at the broader applicability of this particular narrative. Having said that, though, I think it is time to start narrowing the focus a bit and talk about Hinduism specifically. As you might imagine, the history of Hinduism is very complex. And just as there is no single approach to any of the Abrahamic religions, so there is no single approach to Hinduism. For our purposes, as we are talking about a text, it might be useful to trace the history of Hinduism through the history of its most important texts. And these are actually rather numerous. The earliest texts associated with Hinduism are four books known as the Vedas. The Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Samar Veda, and Atarva Veda. These I've listed in chronological order of composition. And the Rig Veda, the oldest of the four, dates back to as early as 1500 BC, making it arguably the oldest book to still be associated with a living religion. This may be rivaled by the book of Job in the Old Testament. I can't think of any others offhand.
Now, as for what the Vedas are, they are collections, for the most part, of hymns, prayers. And these originally would have been memorized by members of the Brahmin caste, the priestly caste, and in fact still are and recited on particular occasions throughout the year or on cycles longer than years actually as well. Many of these reference the doings of the Hindu gods of whom I'll have more to say later, but they're not narrative as such. They refer to things that the gods are imputed to have done, but they don't tell actually the story of the doing of them. These are also the oldest surviving texts, at least the Rig Veda, in any Indo-European language. And here I need to get something right out in the open very quickly. There is, in societies that have a history of monotheism, a tendency to oversimplify polytheistic religion as if it were some simplistic religion out of which the more complex and more sophisticated monotheism evolved. This is basically monotheist propaganda. There is nothing simple and unsophisticated about the Vedas or about Hindu polytheism generally. And this is true of many other polytheisms as well, if you don't look at it through the jaundiced eye of an ideology and a worldview that is basically committed to making it look bad. And as this notion of polytheism is one that pervades Western culture, it's one that I think, regardless of whether you are religious or not, it will be important to try to work through, to not project a cold, distant simplicity onto the gods of a polytheistic religion or polytheistic mythology, when in fact, in many cases, those gods are actually quite accessible and quite psychologically and intellectually complex. No less so, I would argue and will argue, than the singular god of the Abrahamic monotheisms. And do please note when I say this that I am not saying anything negative about monotheism. I'm not disparaging its complexity, I'm simply leveling the playing field by bringing other perspectives up to the same level, where in a Western culture they have typically been disparaged. And now, as long as we're talking about complexity, let's move ahead a little bit in time, because this is just a quick survey, and talk about the Upanishads. The Upanishads are philosophic texts, largely philosophic commentaries, very much bound to the Vedas but also expansions and extrapolations from them. These are some of the richest philosophic texts in the world. There are over 200 of them. They do continue to be written. The most important ones, the dozen or so major Upanishads, were written in the centuries shortly following about 800 BCE. Many of them have been translated into English, all of the major ones have, and I recommend them quite highly to anyone who's interested either in comparative religion or in just philosophy that doesn't happen to be oriented toward the West. I will be referring to specific Upanishads once we jump into the Gita itself. For now though, in our quick little survey, let's jump ahead to about 500 BCE and talk a bit about the Puranas. No, not the fish. Circa 500 BC was actually a very interesting time on the Indian subcontinent and elsewhere in the so-called Old World. For our purposes at the moment, though I will return to it later, it's round about now that much of the mythology and theology and philosophy of Vedic Hinduism underwent a substantial change. One of these changes is an emphasis on different gods. The old gods of Vedic Hinduism are maintained and are still maintained, but three other gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, sort of came to the fore in the discourse, and they represent or embody a different conception of divinity than is at least made explicit in the Vedic gods. So here we end up with sort of a two-tier god system. You've got the major three, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and then you've got the older gods who are referred to as devas. That's where we get our word deva, by the way. Now, in Puranic Hinduism, there is, depending on the text, an emphasis on usually either Vishnu or Shiva, but there is also a sense that these gods are intimately related. I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a few minutes. For now, though, let's talk a bit about the caste system, as I have mentioned this before, and quite frankly, it would be disingenuous to leave out. Now, as for the caste system itself, 
The simplest and best known version of it is the one I've got listed on the slide here. In this system, there are four castes, four hereditary tiers of society to which all people within Hindu society are understood to belong. The highest caste, the Brahmins, are the priestly caste, as I mentioned before. Their primary historical function was to memorize the Vedas, to study sacred scripture, to administer the various rites throughout the year, and basically to maintain society's connection with the divine. In this sense, they are not merely a priestly caste, they are also a scholarly caste. The Upanishads and the Puranas, for example, would have been produced by Brahmins, as would the majority of the commentary tradition. Incidentally, um, just to put a little perspective on here from perhaps a Western-centric point of view, the largest body of theological literature in the world, measured by number of books written, not necessarily by number of books printed, is Hinduism. Hinduism has a larger theological literature than either Islam or Christianity. And there is, as I said, no poverty of sophistication or complexity in any of this. But to move on, the next caste down are the Kshatriyas. They are the warrior caste and the administrative caste. It's from the Kshatriya caste that the kings are drawn. The Brahmins are not kings, but the kings need the support of the Brahmins. The third caste are the Vashyas. These are the farmers and the artisans, those who work the land, those who engage in, as I said, crafts such as smithery, stonework, etc. And also this is the trading class, the ones who engage in commerce. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that the top three castes in this forecast system correspond to the first, second, and third functions of Indo-European mythology, social structure, and that they also correspond to the three estates of medieval Europe, those who pray, those who fight, and those who work the land. That is, this system, as far as I've discussed it so far, seems to actually be um, part of the Indo-European deep past. The Sudras, though, are a slightly different story. The Sudras are the low caste, and that element sud is cognate with the word south, meaning down or low. And this caste doesn't correspond precisely with one of the Indo-European functions. I have actually read, though, some pretty compelling arguments that insofar as these are inherited or heritable castes, that the top three castes would have been descended from the Indo-Europeans who first moved into the subcontinent and subjected the indigenous population to their own rule. So the ancestors of the Sudras would quite possibly have been the ancestors of the peoples of India before the Indo-Europeans got there. This dynamic, of course, of moving into someone else's land and then making them a subject people is by no means unique to India. It seems to be something humans do. But in any case, I hope this gives you a sense of the broader historical context of the system. Now, it might also be worth saying that, on the one hand, the caste system has been used historically as a Western bludgeon, something to beat Hinduism with. On the other hand, many of the worst abuses within the caste system actually took place under British rule, because the British, of course, they did the usual imperial thing and looking into the existing social divides found one that they could exploit. This is not to say that I am endorsing the caste system. It is just to perhaps call out a little bit of Western hypocrisy. This will not be the first time I do that, especially considering that historically the various classes in Western society, while not officially labeled castes, have functioned as much the same thing and done so up until very, very recently. So basically I would like to avoid getting bogged down in labels, especially labels that have been deployed in one polemic or another. Because quite frankly, if we're looking for common ground between, for example, the West and some non-Western societies, for example, India, the entrenched class systems, regardless of what we call them, are not that far apart from each other. And they do seem to be, in both cases, mechanisms for maintaining privilege.
Not only that, of course, but most certainly that as well. And for the record, in modern India, the caste system does not have legal status. Just to be clear about that. Now, I did say I'd talk a bit more about the gods, and I guess it's probably time to do that. Gonna give you a fair warning, when I do this live it usually takes a while, so if you're in a place where you can do so, you might want to make yourself a nice cup of tea. I'll still be here when you get back. We'll start with the Vedic gods because, of course, they were there first, sort of, and they never really went away. And just to be clear, this is not a complete discussion of all of the gods. The Hindu pantheon is, to the best of my knowledge, the largest pantheon in the world. There are major gods, minor gods, gods for pretty much everything you can think of. And gods that have entered the tradition from different cultural sources. But as for the major Vedic gods, here are some of them. The two royal gods, the king gods, are Mitra and Varuna. They tend to rule jointly. Mitra is very active, whereas Varuna is sort of a darker background figure. The two of them tend to be associated in much of the scholarship, at least since the early 20th century, with the first function of Indo-European mythology and society. Mitra seems to be associated with such things as contracts and law and that kind of thing. The name Mitra is cognate with the name Mithra, the god of a religion originating in Persia called Mithraism. Mithraism was very popular among the Roman legionaries in later antiquity, up until about 380 when the emperor Theodosius decreed that Christianity was the only permissible religion in the empire. And the name Varuna has been at least posited to be cognate with the name Uranos, the Greek god, who is the father of Kronos, who is the father of Zeus. Varuna in Hindu mythology seems to be associated with the ocean. In the sense, I think, of that primal chaos that is also actually associated with the vast waters that precede Elohim's act of creation in the Genesis creation myth. Not saying that they're related, but there is actually at least a similar logic underlying both, I think. Next we have Indra. Indra is the champion among the gods. He is associated with the sacred intoxicant Amrita, translated sometimes as Soma, which is the beverage of the gods, very similar to Ambrosia among the Greek gods. It's associated with immortality, and at one point is stolen by Agni, the god of fire, and given to humans. This sounds to me very similar to the Prometheus myth. Sacred intoxicants, by the way, are common in other traditions as well. I'm thinking right now of the mead of poetic inspiration that Odin wins by delving down or diving down rather to the roots of the world tree and retrieving it at the cost of one of his eyes. But that is a digression I had best not go down too far. So, back to our regularly scheduled talk. I believe we were talking about Indra. He is associated with the sky and with rain and wields a lightning bolt as a weapon and is in many ways kind of Zeusy. If you read a book on comparative mythology, you'll often see these two held up against each other. Indra, by the way, has a special connection to Arjuna, so we will be returning to him shortly. If not in this talk, then in the next one. The god of fire is Agni. Now, the name Agni is cognate with the Latin word ignis, which means fire, and Agni is presumed to be present in all instances of fire, so all fire is expressions of Agni. This is also a nice indication of the fact that the polytheistic gods are not bound to single bodies or single locations. They can be, in their own way, omnipresent. Now, the next god I've got listed here is Surya, the god of the sun. Now, that sur element in Surya is cognate with the Latin word sol for sun. That is, when I say something is cognate, I probably should have defined that term earlier. 
Cognate basically means born together. It means they have a common root. In this case, they have a common Indo-European root in a particular word for the sun. Next on the list is Kama, the god of pleasure. Kama corresponds pretty much with the Greek Eros, the Roman Cupid. He is associated with erotic desire and everything attached to that. His name is included in the title of the Kama Sutra. The Kama Sutra, in addition to being a guide to really good sex, is a guide to how to approach sex in such a way as to experience not just communion with the person one happens to be with, but communion with the divine or participation in the divine as well. That is, it's a guide to using sex as a mode of worship. Now, the next god I've got listed is actually one of my favorite ones to talk about. Dios, an older sky god, relatively minor by the time the Vedas are written down, but of course the tradition is always changing and he seems once to have been much more important. He is in fact the father of Surya, so the sky is the father of the sun in this rendition, and his full name is Dios Pitar. Pitar means father. This name is cognate with the Greek Zeus Patar, to give Zeus his full name. Pronounced in Greek, it's more like Zeus. It is also cognate with Jupiter, which would be in Latin Jupiter, or in an older form of the name Dios Patar. It is similarly cognate with the Germanic god Tiwaz, who becomes the god Tyr in Norse mythology, and is the god after whom the day Tuesday, Tiwa's day, is named. All of these gods can be traced back to a Proto-Indo-European sky god, whose name would have been pronounced roughly Dios Peter, and which means basically sky father, or perhaps daylight father, probably a combination of the two. And this is also the word from which we get the Latin word Deus for god, thus deity, etc. Similarly, in Greek, it's where we get the word theos, as in theology. But enough of the language lessons. Let's get back to the Hindu pantheon. Next on the list are a couple of twin gods called the Ashvins. They are associated with beauty and prosperity. I'm not aware of any specific correspondences between them and, for example, the mythology of the Greeks, but I also could be missing something. They do, however, have a close association with a couple of Arjuna's brothers. Again, as we'll discuss, probably in the next talk. Yama is the god of death. He corresponds very closely to Hades among the Greeks and Pluto among the Romans, though death in this culture does mean something different, which we'll get to. And the final god I wanted to mention was Vayu, the god of the wind, also associated with brute strength. He has an association with one of Arjuna's brothers, so we'll be returning to him as well, probably in the second talk. Now, just to complete this very brief comparison, I should also point out that the gods, the Vedic gods, live on a mountain, Meru, which corresponds very closely to Olympus. So the notion of these gods, who have very similar functions, and in some cases a similar name, gathering together on a mountain to discuss and sometimes argue about the affairs of the world, is something that does seem to be common actually across much of the Indo-European um, diaspora, if you want to call it that, in terms of mythology. Now, as we go through this unit, I may have more to say about the gods, I probably will, but for now, it's probably time we leave the Vedic gods behind, as much fun as they are, and maybe say a bit about the gods of the Puranas, because this is where things really get fun. So, what do we say about Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the Puranic Trinity? As you can see from the slide, Brahma is considered to be the creator, Vishnu the sustainer, and Shiva the destroyer. But these things may not mean exactly what you think they mean. The current instantiation of the universe, I guess you can call it, is considered to be part of one day of Brahma. A day of Brahma is basically one waking cycle and one sleeping cycle constituting, I think, about 4.32 billion years, but I'll have to check that up. 
But just as no person wakes and sleeps only once, Brahma also does not wake and sleep only once. So whatever we can say about the time we happen to be in or the age of the cosmos we happen to inhabit, this is just one of countless iterations of, of cosmoses, basically. But Brahma is understood to be basically the personification, I guess, of the principles underlying those cycles. At least that's one way you can think about him. Very few people pray to Brahma because aside from waking up and going to sleep, he doesn't really do much. He's not particularly active in the world. I'm not saying he does nothing, but he's basically the maker, but not the maker in the sense of shaper. He is just awake and we are in some sense dreams of Brahma. You can think of it that way as well. Or if not dreams, then thoughts. I'll be throwing probably a lot of images at you over this unit and they may seem to conflict with each other. That's okay. I wouldn't let that bother you because none of them I think can really adequately address a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to discuss. Images are always approximations, rough attempts to express what may not actually be expressible. This is true in Hindu religion. This is true in Abrahamic religion as well. Trying to hang words on that which defies having words hung on it is on the one hand maybe a futile endeavor, but on the other I think in many ways necessary. Or if not necessary, I think at least deeply human. And the ways in which we, and by we I mean humanity, have come up with doing that are endlessly fascinating and endlessly revealing. But to move on to Vishnu, the sustainer. Vishnu is prayed to a lot. Because he's the one basically who has his hands on the steering wheel in a sense, his hands on the gears. He does take an active hand in the running of the world and is considered to be very accessible. We will have a lot more to say about Vishnu as we go through the Gita. In fact, we will meet him. As for Shiva the Destroyer, Destroyer doesn't mean what it sounds like and I've got to be very honest here, I love Shiva. But in terms of being a destroyer, what Shiva is a destroyer of is not the stuff of the world, but rather illusion. He's associated with not annihilation, but creative destruction. The ending of one cycle so that another cycle can begin. And in some depictions, the dance of Shiva is actually considered to embody the workings and history of the entire cosmos. Because now we're getting to the really fun part. I didn't use that word trinity by accident. While on the one hand, these gods are described as distinct personalities, on the other, they are facets of the same divinity. Sound familiar? It probably should. If you don't have a problem with the trinity in Christianity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, then there is no honest reason why you should have a problem with the Puranic trinity. Brahma the creator, Vishnu the sustainer, Shiva the destroyer. They're not exactly the same functions, but the idea is basically there. A single divinity with three faces, you can think of it that way. I used the image of the statue before when we we're talking about the Trinity, or rather the Christian Trinity. It was imperfect there and it's imperfect here, but at least it covers part of the ground. And the face you're looking at determines the nature of the interaction, determines how you are to think about that thing. And the Hindus were doing this at about 500 BCE. We will find that this is not the only instance of that kind of pattern happening. Now, there is more I'd like to say on these folks, but to do so, I think I'd like to shift from words only to include a few pictures. This also might be a nice break, as I'm having a hunch that this talk is probably the longest one I've done so far. As I've said before, I have no idea how long they're going to be when I start but this one has a lot of slides. I'd like to start with a nice picture of Brahma. As you can see, he is depicted as having four heads and four arms. As the description points out, he has a reddish complexion. He is sitting on a lotus. The image of the lotus is often used as a description or an image rather of the world or the cosmos. And to be honest, this is unscripted. I'm immediately reminded, just talking right now in front of a microphone, of the description of heaven in Dante's Paradiso as a rose, a multifoliate rose with all of the saints on all of the petals. Another mystic vision trying to hang images on that which can't be imagined. 
or can't be imagined accurately. I'm not asserting a relationship between the older god Brahma and the much younger Dante, but I do think that maybe these images resonate nicely together, and that's always fun when it happens. Now here is a picture of Saraswati. She is labeled as the wife of Brahma, and that is often how she is understood. Note that she too is sitting on a lotus, and is associated with the swan as a vehicle. She is forearmed like Brahma, and the Hindu gods are very interesting in that they are not as completely humanized as, for example, the Greek and Roman gods that we in the West may be a little more used to. You'll see this even more as we move along. And this is something I actually really like about them, just from a purely subjective point of view. But this also probably has something to do with the way I understand the gods. That is, not as real things, or rather not as the things that are depicted as being them, but rather as embodiments of, we can say maybe the forces that move the world or the cosmos on the one hand and the forces that move the psyche on the other. This is how I approach pretty much all gods. And this is, in my experience, actually a very rewarding approach. One way I sometimes express it is that the gods are embodiments of those things that are true about the universe, true about the cosmos, true about ourselves, whether we like them or not. They are just there. And I think this works whether you believe in the gods or not. The temptation to humanize them, I think, often runs the risk of maybe missing something, missing something that is actually profoundly other about them. The Hindu gods, the representations of the Hindu gods, don't do this, I think. And this, in some way to me, although they're visibly alien, makes them maybe more approachable than some more humanized divinities. But as I said, this is just a subjective take. The Gita is actually a book that I use in my own life. I don't identify as a Hindu, but it is one of the books I use for interpreting my experience in the world. And I will be talking about it that way as I think that might actually be useful. This is, as I said, a very complex and challenging text, so I'm going to take advantage of as many ways into it as I can think of. But as for Saraswati, there are a couple of other details I'd like to point out about her, and not nearly all that could be pointed out. For one thing, she is playing a veena, a stringed instrument. I think this is a nice, poetic gesture to something we might call the music of the cosmos. That is, whereas we may be considered dreams or thoughts of Brahma, another way of looking at us is as notes on the strings of Saraswati's Veena. Because here's the other fun part. While she is considered sometimes to be Brahma's wife, and all three of the Puranic trinity have wives, these wives are not just wives. They're not gods to whom or goddesses to whom they are married. They are also often considered to be simply the feminine facet of the other god. That is simply the same god in a different form. There's not a hard god-goddess binary here. So in that sense, there is on the one hand a trinity of gods who are one. There's also a trinity of goddesses who are one. And the gods and the goddesses are also one with each other. And hold on to that note of oneness, we're going to be pushing a little further. But before we do that, why don't we take a look at Vishnu? And here's Vishnu. One of the first things you might notice about him is that he is blue. This is the color in which he is usually depicted. Poetic associations with both sky and water would probably not be out of place. And notice that he too has four arms. Multi-armed gods are very common in this mythology. As the note on the slide says, he is incarnated, that is, born in the flesh, nine times, with one more still to come. Hold on to that thought, as it's very important as we go through the Bhagavad Gita. I'm not going to say too much more about it now. He is the main focus of worship in the Vaishnavite school of Hinduism. Vaishnavite simply means devotion to Vishnu. But as I said, the understanding here is that Vishnu is simply one facet of the divine, and this is just one facet of the divine that many Hindus find easy to attach to or to appeal to. Notice also that he's on a snake. I wanted to say a bit about that, because of course in Abrahamic mythology, snakes get a pretty bad rep. Not so in Hinduism. 
And I think Hinduism here is tapping into a much older understanding, a much older mythic understanding of snakes. They are quite naturally a symbol of rebirth, aren't they? Or we could say reincarnation if you wish, because they shed their skins. It looks like they're being born from their own mouths. But also, this particular snake is named Shisha or Shesha. And he is also another image of the beginnings and endings of cycles of the cosmos, which are called kalpas. I'll have more to say about that when we get into the book as well. When he lunges forward, that is the beginning of a kalpa, of an age of the cosmos. And when he retracts back into himself, that is the ending of an age or of a kalpa. Moreover, sometimes he's depicted with the world, he's a cobra, with the world's hanging on his hood or depicted on his hood. So you can imagine how that might work as well poetically because of course a cobra's hood can open and close. So again, you have an image of beginnings and endings, openings and closings. All of these images are very rich and they're intended to be objects or vehicles for contemplation. And just as Brahma has a wife, so does Vishnu. Meet Lakshmi. Lakshmi is one of the most prayed to goddesses in Hinduism. She is, as I said, the wife of Vishnu or the feminine or female facet of Vishnu. And these two things are not mutually exclusive. She is maybe more than any other deity associated with well-being in life, material comfort, but not just material comfort, happiness what we might call just all-around flourishing, living a good life. There is something very motherly and nurturing about her. And notice that she, too, is sitting on a lotus, or in a lotus. Again, the lotus being a very common symbol in Hindu iconography, a symbol of the world, the cosmos itself. It is also worth noting that Hinduism doesn't have anything against rich people. It also doesn't have anything against poor people. Material wealth is good. Being an ascetic can also be good. What matters, no matter what your engagement, is that you engage it in the right spirit. And different schools of Hinduism have slightly different emphases. Hinduism is, by the way, the third largest religion in the world, with a little shy of a billion people. And unlike the two largest religions in the world, it doesn't tend to actively seek to make converts. Usually you're a Hindu because you're born into Hinduism, very similar to being Jewish. How Jewish identity is reckoned, culturally speaking, is uh, just the very basic question, is your mother Jewish? If your mother's Jewish, then you're considered Jewish culturally. So whereas, for example, both Judaism and Hinduism are non-evangelical religions, each kind of gives birth to religions that are evangelical, because of course, Buddhism, as we'll see later, grows out of Hinduism, and it is more outward looking. And incidentally, by numbers, it's the fourth largest religion in the world with something around 500 million adherents. But we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, let's talk about Shiva. But what does one say about Shiva? Well, you probably noticed that he has forearms too. And what he's holding in his hands is interesting or are interesting. In one hand, he's holding a drum. The drum indicates creation coming into being. In the opposite hand, he's holding a staff with something orange on it. In other depictions, this is more explicitly fire. This indicates the fire of destruction. So between the two upper hands, you have the cycle of creation and destruction already depicted. The hand that is raised palm up is giving a gesture of safety and blessing, whereas the hand that's closer to the foot indicates uplifting, so enlightenment. So poetically, the entire cosmos is also present in Shiva. Moreover, you might notice that he has a closed third eye on his forehead. I need to pause on that because the previous gods that we'd looked at had dots on their forehead in what we might call the third eye position. This was most obvious on Lakshmi where it was red, but the other ones also had it. The third eye symbol, and this is not isolated to Hinduism, it occurs in Buddhism and in some Egyptian iconography and in numerous other traditions as well, 
it indicates a heightened state of awareness that is not merely bodily sight but spiritual sight. But here, as I said, on Shiva, it's not just a dot, it is an eye, and the eye is closed. This is important, and this is kind of why I love Shiva. When Shiva's eye opens, the world ends. But as I indicated a while ago, that doesn't mean it's destroyed, its stuff is destroyed. The opening of Shiva's eye indicates seeing through illusion. So what ends is not the cosmos itself, but we might say all of the categories of thought that we've artificially built up so that we can understand it in bits and pieces. So by the world ending in that sense, it is also completely whole, and maybe only then completely whole, because all of those illusory categories of thought, which can be so compelling and yet often so distracting, are just gone. So Shiva's open eye indicates actually complete vision of everything. But that necessarily also is the end of all of the things that are not complete in themselves, which is how all of us live our day-to-day -day lives and I think of necessity. These illusions also incidentally include all of the stories of all of the gods ever told and all of the stories that constitute a difference between, for example, you and me. And of course, Shiva also has either a wife or a divine counterpart, a divine feminine counterpart. Her name is Parvati, or at least that's one of her names, though she sometimes goes under the guise or in the form of Durga and Kali, of whom I'll have a bit more to say in a moment. Moreover, as the information on the slide says, the Puranic trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva has a counterpart in Hindu iconography, specifically Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati, so a simultaneously triple and singular goddess to go with its simultaneously triple and singular god, who are, as I said, also facets of the same divinity, so ultimately unified as well. And as I said before, no one who accepts the notion of the Christian trinity should have any trouble with this. But to get back to Parvati herself, the notion that she is depicted as a mother figure and also as the wife and or feminine counterpart of Shiva, who is associated with destruction, is itself, I think, very interesting. Because then what you have is what we might call the birth principle and the death principle or the creation principle and destruction principle embodied explicitly in one figure, really. And this is something that comes up in other forms and maybe other accents in other mythologies. The one that comes to mind off the top of my head, partly because I'm actually teaching um, <laughs> Lucretius in another class, is the relationship between Venus and Mars, or Aphrodite and Aries if you want to do it in Greek. There as well you have, between love and war, sort of the creation, destruction, positive, negative, arising, subsiding, or outright life and death principles also embodied in their embrace, which is quite entertainingly depicted in Book 16 of Homer's Odyssey. But to return to the mythology at hand, I mentioned Durga a couple of minutes ago. Here is what she looks like. She is, as the slide indicates, simply another facet of Parvati who may simply be just another facet of Shiva. Her typical depiction is to be ten-armed, holding multiple weapons, as is suitable for a deity of war, and riding a tiger, the most ferocious beast in the forest. And here I think I'll pause on some other facet of polytheism that I haven't mentioned before, and will, I think, want to come back to again. Often, mostly by monotheist detractors, Polytheists are depicted as worshipping the images of the gods as if they were gods themselves. The Old Testament does this a lot. Oh, they worship statues. They don't fucking worship statues. The depictions of the divine, be they statues, paintings, what have you, are generally understood to be, by the people who actually practice those religions, representations of the divine. They are no more idolatrous than Christians who pray before the cross. They don't mistake the object for the thing. 
This is a common accusation, as I said, against polytheism and paganism, which is really just propaganda as far as I'm concerned. And the sooner we leave it behind, the more honest conversation we can actually have. Now, in Hindu thought, and I think in other paganisms or polytheisms as well, even the narratives of the gods, the stories of the gods, the figures of the gods themselves are often understood not to be real, but simply to be representations rendered into words in this case of that which cannot actually be rendered into words. That is, the stories themselves are not objects of veneration either. They're simply narratives. And all of these, be they stories, paintings, statues, are simply anchor points for contemplation, I think. Or if you prefer anchor points for devotion, but devotion to that which lies behind the depiction itself. The depicted thing, whether done in words, paint, or stone, is never the thing itself. It's just, as I said, the depiction. Very much as we might actually look at uh, the reading of Scripture, as Augustine recommends, that we are to read Scripture not for the Scripture itself, but for that which it covers, masks, and indicates. This is a useful way of reading not merely Christian Scripture, but I think all religious depictions in whatever medium they happen to occur. And I think this allows us a much more charitable, and I believe, as I said a moment ago, a much more intellectually honest entry point into contemplating polytheistic worldviews if we are coming from either a non-theistic or a monotheistic perspective. Now, though, for one final stop on our visual tour of Hindu iconography, let's meet Kali. Kali, as I mentioned, is another facet of Parvati and also, therefore, another facet of Shiva and therefore also simply another facet of the divine. She is often depicted, as here, in a many-armed form, with a necklace of heads, and in her hands both heads and weapons. And as you can see here as well, she is dancing. Now, the image of the dance of Kali is one of my favorite images of all time, and I think the best poetic description or image of the nature of war that I have ever seen. When Kali dances, and her dance is an image of war, her feet never touch the ground. She dances on the heads of the slain. And this brutally honest depiction of the nature of war is something that always leaves me kind of in awe when I think about it. And here as well, when we're talking about images of the divine, these images are not to be understood as aspirational, but simply, I think, as recognitions. This is the way the world is. And Kali is a poetic depiction of the way the world often is. As the slide indicates, she is associated with both time and death, two things which are kind of inextricably linked. And in Sanskrit, they're not just linked metaphorically, they're linked linguistically. That Kal element in the name Kali signifies both time and death. If we are in time, we are in mortality. That seems to be the logic of that association, and it is something to which we'll return when we're discussing the revelation of the divine at the heart of the Bhagavad Gita. For now, though, I think it's probably time to return to a more quote-unquote academic discussion. In this case, maybe dipping into some historical departures from Vedic Hinduism. Now, some of this I've hinted at already, so I don't expect that this part will take terribly long. If we go back to about 500 BCE, there is a lot of really interesting stuff happening on the Indian subcontinent and off of it as well. We're entering a period that some intellectual historians refer to as the Axial Age. This is a time when much of the foundational material, much of the foundational thinking of not just the thought systems emanating from India, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, are taking form, but also the thought systems coming out of the so-called Holy Land in the form of many of the books of the Old Testament, but also the thought systems of the classical world. This is where we're entering the Golden Age of Athens, and this is also where we enter or are coming, or are coming close to entering the classical age of Chinese philosophy as well. That is, this is, for the next few centuries or next couple of centuries, one of the most exciting intellectual times in the history of the so-called old world. But to return to India, 
As I've mentioned before, there are around this time a number of challenges to Vedic Hinduism. We've discussed, for example, already the rise of Puranic Hinduism, so I won't spend too much time on that, except to say that, down to current times, there are three main schools of thought in Puranic Hinduism, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, and Shaktism. Vaishnavism is Hinduism that focuses on the figure of Vishnu. Now, the Bhagavad Gita is a Vaishnavite text, so we'll be looking at that perspective particularly in following discussions. Shaivism focuses on Shiva. Shaktism focuses on the goddess Shakti, whose other names include Parvati, Durga, Kali, and a number of others. And in that sense, she can be understood simply as the feminine facet of the divine itself. Because in this mythology, the divine in its source texts does not go by explicitly patriarchal or masculine names and or pronouns. Now, as for the two remaining worldviews, Jainism and Buddhism, I'll say a little bit about them here, but of course we'll have more to say about Buddhism in a couple of weeks. Hinduism, Jainism, and Buddhism collectively are known as the Dharmic religions, as they all involve or refer to a concept known as Dharma, which I will get into in more detail in a moment. Unfortunately, we won't have time to look into Jainism in this class, and this is with genuine regret on my part. I happen to see Jainism as the most peaceful religion in the world, or at least the most peaceful religion that I've ever encountered in my explorations. And it is largely from Jainism, actually, that peace activists such as Gandhi on the one hand and Martin Luther King on the other get much of their ethos, directly or indirectly. Jainism is a completely nonviolent religion whose central principle of doing no harm to any living thing is taken to such an extreme if you follow it strictly, and you will see this if you read any of the Jain Sutras, that, for example, if you are drinking water, what you want to do is have a thin cloth over your cup so that you don't accidentally consume any small living thing that might be in the water. And if you see down to this day Jain monks processing, they will often sweep the path in front of them to sweep aside any little creepy crawlies because they really don't want to step on them. They don't just talk the talk, they quite literally walk the walk. So if you're looking for a worldview or a religion that genuinely does recognize the absolute sanctity of life, Jainism may well be for you. And yes, if you become a Jain and follow Jainism strictly, you will also become a vegetarian. As for Buddhism, which develops around this time as well, and as I said, to which we will return, one of the main distinctions between Buddhism and Hinduism, though by no means the only one, is that Buddhism rejects the caste system. But it still maintains many of the central philosophic notions that are present in Hinduism itself, though of course it puts its own spin on them and pursues them in some really interesting directions. In the relationship between Buddhism and Hinduism, you can draw a rough analogy from the relationship between Christianity, say, and Judaism. But of course, as with any analogy, you don't want to push it too far because there are always and will be significant differences. And on that note, let's talk a bit about Dharma. So what is Dharma anyway? As this is central to the Hindu worldview and the Buddhist worldview as well, I think we'd better try to get a handle on it. The root of the word is the Sanskrit word dri, which means support. And one can read this, I think, in a few different ways. That which supports a life, that which supports society, that which supports the world. And while it has no direct translation into English, it has been translated as duty, religion, law, righteousness, and does certainly contain strong elements of all of those. But I don't think any single one adequately covers the full range of what Dharma actually means. It may be useful to think of it as a complex code of conduct that arises from one's place in society on the one hand and one's own nature on the other. That is, Dharmas are specific both to castes and to individuals. The overall Dharma, for example, of a Brahmin is to study the Vedas, for instance, to study 
religion in general, to conduct rituals, to share their learning in the appropriate way, in an appropriate measure, and at the appropriate time, and to maintain for society at large an active connection to the divine, without which society at large is understood to be incomplete. The Dharma of Akshatriya, on the other hand, is to, for example, fight, but to fight the right people for the right reasons. This is the warrior side of the Kshatriya Dharma, but also as an administrator, because the Kshatriyas are also administrators, to see to the running of the realm conscientiously and competently, and always again for the right reasons, the right reasons never being mere self-interest, and so on down the scale. But there are also individual dharmas, as we'll see when we get into the Gita. That is, within the overall or overarching dharma of one's place in society, there is also a specific thing that is best for you to do. And this can be seen as descending from the divine if you wish, but I think it perhaps can more usefully be seen as arising from one's own nature. Now, having said that, it sounds like I've posited an opposition. I haven't, because these two things are actually understood to be intimately related to each other. This also is something that we'll have more to say about once we jump into the text itself. But broadly speaking for now, and this is just in a Hindu context, it changes in Buddhism. One's dharma is basically doing broadly speaking what is appropriate to the level of society into which one is born and also doing as well as one can and for the right reasons those things that arise from the proper understanding or the best understanding of one's own nature. In that sense, following one's dharma is a way of approaching the best possible life for a human being in this understanding. Now, dharma can be either embraced or rejected. You're always free to seek or not seek, to embrace or not embrace your dharma. That is to pursue dharma or to become a dharma, a as in the gator in Sanskrit as in both Latin and Greek. So really, broadly speaking, living one's dharma or doing one's dharma, I've sometimes heard it expressed, involves necessarily knowing oneself and acting on that knowledge. And I think this brings us around to a discussion of time. The understanding of which, compared to, for example, the Abrahamic religions, is very, very different. Abrahamic mythology posits a moment of creation, that is, an absolute beginning, as far as the world or cosmos is concerned, and it posits in its three various strands, broadly speaking, an end toward which the cosmos and thus history is moving. That is, Abrahamic mythology posits linear time. A beginning followed by a long unfolding followed by an end, at which point there will be a judgment, the consequences of which will be eternal. The Dharmic religions with their associated mythologies do not make these suppositions. Time in these worldviews, and for now I'll just confine myself to Hinduism, is cyclic, that is, it goes in circles. There never was an absolute beginning, and there will never be an absolute end. What follows is that there will never be a final judgment and the consequences of any given life are not eternal. This is a radically different way of looking at the world and of looking at a life and a human being and what a human being actually is. That is, the Abrahamic and Dharmic world views posit radically different understandings of human nature itself. The most obvious difference is reincarnation. We are not just here once, we are here over and over and over again. This, of course, is perfectly in line with the notion of the ages of the cosmos, the kalpas, being days of Brahma, for instance. Those cosmic cycles of arising and subsiding on the grand scale are reflected on the human scale in the arising and subsiding of lives after lives after lives. And this notion is not unique to the Dharmic worldviews. We see echoes of it in other Indo-European cultures, both philosophically and mythologically. That is, it seems to have been something that the Proto-Indo-Europeans incorporated into the ways that they looked at the world. 
its articulations in the thought systems emanating from India are perhaps more complete than what we see echoes of maybe in European cultures and European philosophy and mythologies. Not because the systems weren't as fully fleshed out there, I think, but because so much of European culture has been overwritten or outright erased by other incoming worldviews. But enough remains, for example, in Pythagoras's notion of metempsychosis, the myth of Ur toward the end of Plato's Republic, which explicitly deals with the subject of reincarnation, other echoes of cyclic time in Indo-European thought, or Proto-Indo-European thought, can be found as well in the remains of both Celtic and Norse mythology, though in reading these one always has to engage in a sort of intellectual archaeology because the people who actually believed these myths didn't write them down, and in most cases they were simply forgotten in many cases, actively suppressed. But enough was written down in, for instance, Ireland and Iceland, representing the Celtic and Germanic worlds respectively, to make that kind of intellectual archaeology possible. And in the conclusion of the Old Norse Fall of Spa, for instance, which does tell of the creation and destruction of the world, there is a very clear element of rebirth indicated in the end of the poem, which can be attributed, and I think should be attributed, to an inheritance from the Indo-European cultural past. But this is a digression down which I shouldn't wander too far because it's taking us wide of our actual subject matter. I might also note that both cyclic time and reincarnation seem to have been present in Dravidian mythology. Now, the Dravidian peoples and the Dravidian languages were the peoples and languages who occupied much of the Indian subcontinent before the Indo-Europeans arrived. Linguistically, the Dravidian languages are represented, I think, most widely or most numerously by Tamil on the island of Sri Lanka. Much of Hindu mythology does seem to be actually a fusion of Indo-European and Dravidian mythology. So this notion of cyclic time and reincarnation, I think, arises naturally from the observation of the cycles of the world, the seasonal cycles, for instance and is present in many, many worldviews. So when we look at the Hindu and Buddhist versions of it, we are actually looking at something that reaches far, far back into prehistory. But to return to a specifically Hindu context, and much of this is also continued into Buddhism, I'd like to address now three specific concepts that are important to the understanding of the Gita, samsara, karma, and nirvana. Samsara can be understood simply as the wheel of time, a concrete image for the notion of time going around and around and around, both in terms of lives and in terms of cycles of the cosmos. In terms of lives, what this means is that every time you are reborn, you are simply occupying another spot on samsara. Sometimes I actually use the image of a Ferris wheel, and you are always on the ride. Each life is another go-around on the ride, and some seats are better than others. Some positions are better to be born into than others. Some bodies, some forms are better to be born into than others. And in terms of what determines the type of seat you get, your position on the ride, this is karma. Now, the word karma is in common use in popular culture, and sometimes that actually can be a bit of a problem. When I ask students, for example, what their idea of karma is, I'll usually get some version of what goes around comes around. And while this is superficially correct, I think it is wide of the mark in terms of how the notion of karma functions in contemplating the arc not merely of a single life, but of an existence spread out over multiple lives. You can have good karma or bad karma, depending on how you conduct yourself. This is also related to how you think, that is, your understanding. And your karma can be, well, to take a metaphor, heavy or light. It can drag you down or it can lift you up. And the state of your karma at the end of one life will determine where you go next and what happens to you. A life whose karmic burden is comparatively light may result in an auspicious rebirth, whereas a life 
whose karmic burden is heavier may result in an inauspicious rebirth. And one's rebirths are not limited to the human form. One might be reborn as a non-human animal, for instance. Any kind of non-human animal, if one's karmic burden is very heavy. One might also be reborn as a god, because in this conception there is not an absolute barrier between the human and the divine. I'll say that again. In this conception there is not an absolute barrier between the human and the divine. And even more importantly, the most fortunate birth that one can hope for is a human birth. It is better to be born as a human than to be born as a god. Because it is as a human in that midpoint between divinity and bestiality that the fullest perspective of one's existence can be gained. Gods are not subject to the kind of suffering that humans are subject to. And animals, or non-human animals, are not capable of the kind of thought that humans are capable of. So in thinking of the human as an animal body with the mind of a god, you can actually see that the human existence is the one that offers the greatest possibility for learning, for understanding. It is arguably the fullest instantiation of an experience of the cosmos. At least that's one way of looking at it. And in that sense, if you have a human life, you are very lucky. But let's get back to karma. Unlike being judged, karma is completely impersonal. There is no one deciding what your karma is. There is no karmic judge and jury, no one before whom you will ever stand. Karma can usefully be thought of, I think, and very simply be thought of as cause and effect. Just that, just cause and effect. No more personal than gravity. And on that note, I should probably say something as well about heaven and hell, or heavens and hells. In Hinduism and in Buddhism, there are heavens and hells, or at least those words are used in the translations. But these are to be understood very differently from the Abrahamic heavens and hells, or heaven and hell, in that they're not eternal. You might find yourself in a Hindu hell if your karmic burden is very heavy, and what happens to you there is basically you are purged of your karmic burden. But this is not eternal. So in that sense, the Hindu hell or hells are more usefully thought of as something like the Christian purgatory. Similarly, you may find yourself in a Hindu heaven, but this also is not eternal. This is simply the effect of a very light karmic burden. You find yourself in very pleasant circumstances for a long time because your actions and your understanding has brought you there. But you will eventually find yourself living another life, at least until you figure out a way to get off the ride. And this brings us around to nirvana. Now, when I ask my students what the word nirvana conjures for them, I typically get answers something like the Hindu or Buddhist heaven, or something like that. But this isn't actually accurate. The word nirvana signifies literally snuffing out, as in the snuffing out of a candle flame. But it doesn't signify a nihilistic position, as sometimes I have heard it represented or misrepresented. It is the snuffing out not of one's existence, but of one's ego consciousness. We can put it that way, I think. That is, it can be understood as the snuffing out of the notion and the perception that one is a discrete being in comparison to everything else and everybody else. And in that sense, it is not an elimination, but really an expansion. A becoming one with that with which you are already one, if only you had known how to look at it properly. This also is something we'll be getting into in some depth when we jump into the Gita itself. Now, so far I've been talking about samsara and nirvana in their literal meanings, but like so much religious and mythological text and imagery, these can also be thought of figuratively in the course of a single life. We might go through cycles in our personal lives where we experience something like a death to what we were and something like a rebirth into something else. We may become trapped in images of ourselves that are constraining and painful and need to find ways out of those. 
the images of samsara and nirvana, though not necessarily referring to actual real things, may be useful in navigating that psychological landscape. This too will be something that we explore a little more as we go through the text. For now though, I think it's time to move on and to address one final question, that is, how to approach the gods as they appear in Hindu mythology. Now, as I mentioned before, the Hindu pantheon is huge. To the best of my knowledge, the biggest pantheon in the world, though of course I could be wrong. And certainly it isn't wrong to see each of these gods as discrete beings. As I mentioned before, I think, I find the metaphors of polytheism to actually be very useful in understanding and navigating my experience of the world, and I know I'm not unique in finding it thus. On the other hand, and again as I've mentioned, there is also in much Hindu thought an understanding of an overall unity underlying all of these gods, not just the Puranic trinity in both masculine and feminine facets, but all of the gods together can be understood as simply different facets of this one overarching divinity. And as I've used the image of facets of gems before, it applies here as well. So you may be looking at a Kali facet, or an Indra facet, or an Agni facet, or a Vishnu facet, and you're always actually addressing the same thing, or looking at the same thing, just in a different aspect of its being. Now here I also want to draw a comparison with Christianity. I've mentioned the trinities before, so I'm not going to take up too much of your time with that, but also, depending on the version of Christianity you're looking at, because there is no single one, but Christianity has angels and devils and demons, and these are comparable to, for example, the devas, the Vedic gods, who are understood to be lesser gods than the Puranic gods. Christianity doesn't use the word gods, but if you look beyond what I think are the illusory distinctions that are conjured by words and examine function, there's a great deal of common ground. They don't map onto each other identically, their Venn diagrams are not identical, but they are far more similar than different. Similar, Christianity, some versions of Christianity, particularly Catholic and Orthodox Christianity, have saints. Well, there are gurus and rishis and swamis, particularly sacred or holy people, people of supreme spiritual attainment in Hinduism as well. So, again, looking beyond the superficial distinctions conjured by language, there is actually a great deal of common ground between Hinduism, for instance, and many forms of Christianity. I bring this up because, as I've mentioned before, I am far more interested in building bridges than putting up walls, and there are plenty of opportunities here for bridges. There is also, though, a non-theistic understanding of Hinduism, and this isn't just me projecting onto it. Some Hindu thinkers themselves will tell you, no, there are no gods, these are just images. All of the stories of gods are just images that we use to focus on, to contemplate our own existence. That is, there may well be a recognition in some schools of Hindu thought that all of the gods, all of the myths, are poetry, metaphors, ways of looking at our own lives. Because, and I think I've mentioned this before as well, there's probably much about the cosmos, probably much about our own existence, that we can never adequately wrap our minds and therefore wrap our words around, but we need to have some way of thinking about it. Language does that for us, but images also do that for us. But they all always necessarily have limits. And maybe all of our narratives and all of our myths are constrained by those same limits, and we can never adequately articulate what it is that we are. But our stories of gods, or our stories of God, give us ways of exploring those questions. And I'm going to actually mess things up just a little bit more by saying that the polytheistic, monotheistic, and non-theistic interpretations within a Hindu context are not even necessarily mutually exclusive. And just to be mischievous, I'm not going to explain myself. And that finally brings us around to the end of this little beast of a lecture. This will probably be the longest single talk that I throw at you folks all term. <laughs> 
And as of this recording, I have no idea how long it actually is because I haven't edited it yet. What I hope at this point is that you're at least well into your readings. I will be doing another introductory talk, trying to situate the Gita within its overall narrative context because it is actually part of a much longer piece of writing, some of which I think will matter to us. But that won't take nearly as long as this one. And then I may do a... Uh, an audio-only talk at the end of the week, or for the end of the week, because I'm recording this ahead of time, addressing at least book one of the Gita, which is the book that sort of situates the conversation that is to follow over the next several discourses. Please, by the end of the week, read to the end of Discourse 6, and next week I will just be doing content only. For now, Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this interesting. This, as you can probably tell, is a, a piece of writing that has fascinated me for a long time and one that I never tire of exploring. Perhaps you might have wished I'd gotten a little more tired before now. But in any case, I do hope your reading is going well, and I do look forward to our interactions online regarding this one. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.